So now we're getting into planting production. You've got this in your, they're getting some terms right now. You've got this image here. Uh, and we're going to come back to it a few times during the, the lecture, just as a reminder of the incredible importance that, that plants, uh, the flowering, uh, the reproductive structures of plants, uh, seeds and fruits and things like that play for humans and human nutrition, right? A lot of the calories, most of the calories that most people on the planet consume on a daily basis come from the reproductive structures of plants. So it's really important for, for people, and this, this slide will help us emphasize that. Um, this is a weird cartoon that I drew a bunch of years ago for somebody who was doing a, a talk in Germany. That's why it's in German. But it's funny to think about the dinosaurs. Did you know the dinosaurs spoke German? A little known fact. But uh, this little guy saying, uh, it's both with the rosen chicken, the PhD of sin is not mixed to endostatin. It's good, right? Um, and what he's saying is, hey, I would have, I would have gotten you roses, but they haven't evolved yet. Right. So, uh, and my point of showing this is to remind you that flowering plants are evolutionarily very recent, right? The dinosaurs were sort of at their peak around 165 million years ago. Flowering plants didn't really appear until about 100 million years ago. Um, but since then, it's been, one of the, it's been one of the most successful radiations of any group of organisms ever, right? Because these plants are, um, I have really, you know, the flowering plants have been very, very successful, but evolutionarily fairly recent. Okay, so now we're going to get into some of the details. Oh, yeah, let me also say about this. Uh, really look at the objectives before you do a lot of reading for this. Uh, you're going to read a, a good chunk of chapter 38, and also you're going to go back into chapter 37 and do some of the stuff that's back there as well. So you're going to get 37 and 38. There is a lot of vocabulary in uh, chapter 38 that you are not responsible for. Vocabulary about, you know, the different types of fruits and things like that. It might be very helpful for you to prepare for your lab final. But uh, but it's not critical so much for the lecture. So definitely, this is a case where you want to look at the objective, and it'll help you be much more efficient as you study for this new material. Okay. So now, uh, I want you to imagine a cell, a regular diploid cell, that goes through the cell cycle. So it goes through the replication and mitosis. But then it just does not do that very last stage of mitosis, where it actually goes from being one cell to being two daughter cells, right? That's cytokinesis. So in other words, everything's going to stay in one cell, all right? So, um, so as you keep replicating the DNA, the chromosomes, replicating the nuclei and everything like that, they're all just going to stay in this one large central cell. So after three rounds of mitosis, how many, uh, there would be how many nuclei in that cell? So go ahead and have everybody, go, don't put your hands up yet, just think about it. Um, all right, so we're going through replication mitosis, but then not going through cell division. Okay, go ahead. Hands up. What do you like for this one? Okay. All right. Getting everybody here uh, in in the room. Oh, most people going for C, which is correct, right? So there's going to be eight nuclei in that cell, right? So we're talking about here, we have this, here's the nucleus of the cell. It's going to go through one round of cell division. Then there's going to be two nuclei in that cell, right? And then, so it's just going to double each round, so we would end up with eight total nuclei. All right. The reason why we're talking about this is because this is part of the uh, interesting and unique way that plants make their gametes is they do go through, they, they definitely go through meiosis, right? You have to, to make haploid cells, you got to go through meiosis. But then that is followed in plants by uh, a variable number of rounds of mitosis without cytokinesis, where all the nuclei stay in the same cell. So we're going to think here about the, the gametes and how they form. This is at the bottom of page 41. Now, it's going to be helpful for you. We're going to use the, the variable N a lot. And just to remind you, in genetics, N is the number of chromosomes in a haploid nucleus. The number of chromosomes in a haploid nucleus. So for humans, that number is 23. N is 23. Okay, so we're going to start off with a diploid cell here, which is 2N, right? So that's two of each chromosome. And then these double arrows here represent the two rounds of cell division of meiosis. And that's going to give us four haploid cells. So we have this drawn on here twice because we're going to think about the two different types of gametes that plants make. And we're going to look at sort of the most complicated one first. So in, in, uh, inside the flower, there's cells that go through meiosis. 
four of these haploid cells are going to die. You know, they they commit cell, they go through program cell death, and they don't contribute anything. But the other cell now is going to go through three rounds of mitosis. So three times mitosis without cytokinesis. So in other words, we just did the math on that, right? We're going to have eight nuclei in this cell. Now, they don't, they're not randomly distributed through the cell. So we're going to actually draw this structure. This is a kind of complicated structure, but it's going to have be a large central cell with eight nuclei in it. And in fact, this is in the textbook, those nuclei do sort of get compartmentalized by cell walls and things like that inside of the, this larger structure. But we have this large central cell and there's going to be three haploid nuclei that sort of hang out near what we're going to call the top of the cell. It's going to be three haploid nuclei hanging out here at the bottom of the cell as well. And then there's two haploid nuclei that kind of hang out in the center of this large central region. So we've got eight nuclei, and it's really in one cell. And this is called the, the embryo sac. Okay, so that's one of our two gametes that forms. Now, the, the better known gamete for plants is pollen, right? So we're gonna think about how pollen forms. Again, down here, we start with a, hap, a diploid cell, so 2N, it's gonna go through meiosis, we're going to end up with these four haploid cells. And then each one of these in the above, it was just one of the cells that went on to become the embryo sac. But all of these haploid cells that are produced by meiosis are going to go, go through uh, one round of mitosis without cytokinesis again to produce the single cell that has two haploid nuclei in it. And again, there is some like little partitioning that happens in there, but essentially it is one, one full cell that has these two nuclei in it. And this is a pollen, a pollen grain. And remember each one of these is gonna become, you know, each one of these haploid cells is going to become one of those pollens. All right, so notice that the theme here, right? We, in both cases, you have your meiosis first, and then we have either one or three rounds of mitosis but outside of pictures, leaving us with these multi-nucleated cells, which are the two plant gametes, the embryo sac and the pollen. All right. By the way, one thing, those of you who took Bio 160, in Bio 160, you think a lot about the alternation of generations in terms of like sporophytes and gametophytes. We're not really gonna go through all of that vocabulary again. Again, there's a big section of that chapter 38. So we're not going to focus on that for, for by 162. All right. So you have this actually also on page 41 there. And yeah, so we're just kind of comparing and contrasting these two gametes, the embryo sac and the pollen. The embryo sac is non-mobile. It stays inside the parent, right? So it stays in parent. Whereas the pollen is mobile. Um, the embryo sac contributes not just DNA, but also cytoplasm, so things like mitochondria and chloroplasts and everything like that. It contributes those to the embryo, whereas the pollen only contributes uh, DNA to that fertilized egg or to that fertilized cell. And so, because of this, you know, it's not a perfect comparison, but the embryo sac is sometimes referred to as the female gamete in uh, in plants, and the pollen is referred to the male gamete in the plants, and if those words are helpful for you as you're studying this and comparing and contrasting with uh, the animals, then that's fine. But I think the, these characteristics align pretty well with the male and female gametes in animals. All right. So now we want to think about fertilization. So when we get, how do we get these two together? And what happens with all of these different nuclei that are floating around inside these cells as we, uh, as we do fertilization? So you have this. Uh, on page 42. And so this is about as far as I'm going to get into like a lot of anatomical, uh, um, into a lot of uh, anatomy terms. Okay. So we're thinking about parts of the flower here. Um, this brown part down here is the ovary. And inside the ovary is that embryo sac. So we're just going to draw in these circles to represent those, those eight haploid nuclei that are in the, in the ovary. 
Okay, so some other parts here. This the the tip of the structure that comes off of the ovary is called the. Well, I'll label it up here. This is the stigma. This part down here is the style. And collectively, these uh, these three components that we've labeled: the stigma, the style, and the ovary. Collectively, this whole part is referred to as the carpal. Okay. Now, if you want to know like where this is oriented relative to the rest of the the plant, um, you know, the if we wanted to draw the rest of the flower, this there'd be a stem coming off the bottom of the ovary that connects it to the plant, the parent plant, and then the petals and sepals and other structures and stuff like that are at the base of it here. Right? So we're really they're digging in on this this part that contains the reproductive structures. Okay. So. For fertilization, we need to get a pollen attached to this, and so the pollen is going to attach to the stigma. Now I'm drawing, this is not drawn to scale. The pollen would be really, really tiny compared to the, the, the floral structures here. But we've got this pollen with these two little nuclei on it. And that's, you know, a really amazing uh, event takes place after that in cell biology, where this pollen grain starts to grow. It grows something called a pollen tube. And now this is not a multicellular structure. This is a, an extension coming off of this one cell. And it's going to grow from the pollen here down the uh, oops, down the style around the over here. And then it's going to kind of connect with that embryo sac down at the bottom. So this thing I just drew in here, this is the pollen tube. And then those two little nuclei the pollen grain, they're going to travel down that tube. So again, this is all done. You think about biowestins one, you learned about the cytoskeleton. You know, to make that, that tube grow um, is a whole lot of motor protein, microfilaments, things like that, changing their shape. And then uh, uh, other motor proteins uh, are going to drag those two nuclei down this pollen tube and allow them to, enter, to basically enter the embryo sac down there at the bottom. I'll show you some more about that in just a second. But while we've got this up here, we can think about after fertilization. So here's after after fertilization. What are we going to have, right? So we've got those eight haploid nuclei in the embryo sac. And now we're going to throw two more nuclei into the mix. And some of those are going to fuse. And so these, these top ones up here at the top, they're going to stay haploid. So those are unaffected. There's two more that are unaffected. And then the two nuclei that are coming in from the from the pollen are going to fuse with the, the remaining nuclei there. So this cell down here is going to become haploid because this is going to have that one nuclei that was already in that, that little region. And then it's going to be it's going to fuse with the one of the sperm nuclei. And so that's going to give us a diploid cell. And this is actually going to turn into this cell here is basically the 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 zygote, right? This is the one that's going to turn into the little embryo plant. So this guy is the zygote. And now here's the thing that's probably going to feel the most different to you between plants and animals is that, you know, this is this technically this whole process we're looking at is called double fertilization. Because remember, there are two nuclei that are going to come down from that pollen and one of them, you know, pollen, uh, one of them merges with this single haploid nuclei here to make a diploid, uh, a, a, a diploid cell. And the other one is going to merge with these two in the middle here that we're hanging out to make a triploid structure. So triploid means three of each chromosome, right? So three N. And this is going to become the structure we call the endosperm. All right, so double fertilization to get two nuclei coming down from the pollen. One of them is going to be involved in the fertilization event that leads to the next generation. That makes this little diploid cell that's going to go on to become the embryo. And then the other one is going to merge with those two nuclei in the middle to become a structure called the endosperm, which is very important for the development of the seed, but is not going to contribute anything to the next generation. All right. So let me stop there and just see if I can answer any questions so far. Yes. Right. So remember, if we look at this here, right, there's each of those little circles that I drew, they represent haploid nuclei, 
So they each have, for whatever plant, let's say this is a watermelon plant. Uh, each haploid nucleus has 11 chromosomes in it, right? So, um, so you've got those two separate nuclei. Then another one's going to come in from the sperm. So that's going to bring 11 more nuclei, or 11 more chromosomes. And then those three are going to fuse, right? Nuclear fusion is something that, that happens in fertilization of both plants and animals, right? With those two nuclei from the egg and the, the sperm, from the embryo sac and the pollen, they come together and those chromosomes mix together in that new nucleus that forms. So in the central cell, we add one more set of chromosomes, we're going to have three times the, the haploid number, right? So 33 chromosomes in the case of a watermelon, um, for example. Okay. Any other good question? Or any other? Okay. <laughs> So just real quick about that, the, the pollen tube that grows down there, you know, like flowers are, you know, like a pollen is, uh, in a lot of species, is a, a very small or even microscopic structure, but it's just this tiny single cell. And it's going to grow this long extension here. This is a hibiscus flower. And you can see that the stigma there is about 10 centimeters. So you know, this little single cell has to grow this 10 centimeter long extension to go all the way down the, uh, the style there and connect with the embryo sac. So, you know, and that happens really very fast after pollination as well. Um, here's corn. Now, uh, what's shown down here, this is not a pollen grain with its pollen tube. This is one, this is basically a flower on corn, right? Where that yellow thing down at the bottom in the middle, that's the ovary. And then that long thing wrapped around it there, which is about 11 centimeters long, which we would call a silk on a, on a corn plant. Uh, that is the the stigma and the style. And so when a pollen grain lands on the end here, right, you're going to get this one tiny little pollen grain stuck on the end, and then it's going to grow very quickly uh, at a rate here. You can see up at the top is pollen grains growing these little tubes. It's about one centimeter an hour, which is actually pretty fast. If a pollen grain, I can calculate this much, if a pollen grain was the size of a regulation NBA basketball, and we set it here, uh, if its pollen tube would grow about 60 meters in an hour. So you think that's going to go up the thing here and out the door and, and probably out into the waiting area out in the front there. So this is really an amazing event of cell biology, right? Because you're going to have the single cell that grows this long, long extension, and then those two nuclei travel down it. All right. So we've got fertilization, right? We've got uh, fertilization happening. And the next thing is, is going to develop is the seed. And I really think the importance of seeds cannot be overstated, right? For, uh, as I said in the, in the intro, like for human nutrition, uh, uh, seeds are incredibly important. And then also just for the success of flowering plants, seeds have been this really, really incredible um, uh, evolutionary innovation that has allowed the, the flowering plants to really, to, to really conquer the entire globe. Um, here's one reflection of the importance of seeds. This is the global seed bulb in Svalbard, Norway. So they dug down into the permafrost down there, and uh, inside they have just a big collection of seeds. They've got almost over a million different types of seeds, both crops and also wild varieties. And they have little packets that are probably about you know 500 to 1,000 seeds for each species that they keep. And the reason why they did it in Norway down in the permafrost is because they had to have a way of keeping it really cold, right? Because as long as those seeds are cold, they stay viable for a very long time. And, you know, part of the part of the reason for the philosophy for building this was that if there was some sort of, you know, major global event, some sort of catastrophe that wiped out a whole lot of uh, crops and things like that, there would be a backup for these seeds that have been so important for, for mankind um, up here buried under the permafrost. All right, now, as far as you've got this here on page uh, uh, 40, 42, right? But the function of seeds, I think we can say pretty quickly, they, they protect out of the embryo. They are important for uh, dispersal of the, uh, you know, the, of the seeds away from the parent plant. And also uh, they are important for energy storage, right? That little embryo plant, once it germinates, it's gonna need some sort of supply of energy until it can start you know, photosynthesizing on its own. And so the seed provides that. All right. This is just a figure for your book, but I wanted to go over it and clarify a, a few things about it. Um, and because of, that this is uh, important in terms of, you know, these two major different types of seeds that are produced by the flowering plant. And also for thinking particularly about the nutrient storage aspect of this. All right. So we've got a new term here, a cotyledon.
also sometimes called a seed leaf. These are these are structures, and it's kind of I, 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 I'm pointing this out because it's kind of hard to tell from this diagram in your textbook here. But these are actually part of the embryo, so they are part of that little embryo plant. So they're part of the embryo, and now there's you know we can broadly. Uh, divide the flowering plants into two categories. The dicotyledonous plants, those are the ones that have two of these little cotyledons there in the seed. And then the monocotyledonous plants, the monocots, that have just one of these structures inside the seed. Um, as you can kind of see from the picture here, the dicotyl, a good example of a dicot plant is a bean, you know, uh, that's, that's a classic example there. Monocots, uh, a lot of the grains here, so things like rice and corn, wheat. Basically, a lot of grasses are monocots. That's after the single cotyledon. Okay, so let's let's diagram. Let's point some things out here. First of all, in both of these pictures, there is an embryo. So this is derived. This is diploid. So two n. It's derived from that one cell that uh, that was drawn. We drew at the bottom of the embryo sac. And so in both of these, we have the embryo here and here. It's shown in brown. Uh, in this figure. So that, that's the, the embryo. Okay, now we have the, the cotyledons, right? And so in our dicotyledonous plant, there's two of them. But remember these, even though it doesn't look like it here, these are actually part of the embryo, right? They are, they have developed as part of the embryo. Like for instance, when a bean plant germinates, you know, it's going to uh, come up and the first two leaves that form on this little bean plant here, this little apical meristem, you know, these first two leaves that open up there, those are actually the, the cotyledons, right? So when I think about a little plant germinating, the first two leaves that form are, are there present inside the seed. All of the other leaves that come after that, they are going to uh, form off of the apical meristem, but the two seed leaves are in there. So, so we have these uh, cotyledons and these are, I guess I'll write this again. Cotyledon. These are also diploid because they are part of the, the embryo. And so here's these two. So I'm kind of messing up my diagram here. Clean this up. All right. So these two cotyledons that are present in this dicotyledonous plant, these are the same two that are going to become these first two leaves here when that plant eventually germinates. All right. And those, and again, just even though it doesn't look like it here, those are part of that little embryo. Okay, here in the monocot, sorry. There is also a cotyledon, a diploid cotyledon that's shown in green here. So it's this smaller structure, but most of the volume of that gene is taken up by something else. And what that is, that is the, the endosperm, that triploid structure. Just to remind you, that's 3N. So that was formed by that other fertilization event. Now, in both the monocots and the dicots, I can just say, in both the monocots and the dicots, um, there is an endosperm that forms, right? Every time you get fertilization, you form that triploid cell that leads to the endosperm. It's just that it, 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 it essentially becomes just a tiny part of the dicot seed, where it is the, the majority, it makes up most of the monocot seed. Um, so they both do have an endosperm. It's just that it's so tiny that we can't really see it in the, the in the dicot. Yeah. Uh, right. So in this picture here of the dicot, there is no endosperm visible. Oh, these these little things here. Those those are actually like. You know, that's why I think it's kind of weird about this picture because they, they wanted to show some things clearly, but in doing so, they made some other things confusing. If you think about this little drawing that I drew here on the side, right? So here's the little above ground part of the plant kind of merging out of the soil. Um, you know, each of these is, is it, those are the, the two, little, two little bits of stem that connect that central part of the embryo to those cotyledons. Yeah. Okay. So here's the one of the reasons I wanted to highlight this too. We can think about energy storage, right? So um,
where is the where is the site of energy storage right in the dicots it is here in the uh in, in those cotyledons right so those structures that are so essentially it is the embryo itself that is storing the, the food that it's going to need once it germinates right the, the nutrients and the sugar molecules um or oils or starches whatever form this plant is storing energy and it's going to be stored there in the cotyledons Whereas the primary site for energy storage in the monocots is in the endosperm. That's going to be the place where most of the energy um, is going to be stored that that little embryo plant then will then access once it germinates. All right, so just two major groups of plants here, the monocots and the dicots. And I think this you know, emphasizes all the things I want you to be able to compare and contrast about them. You know, what is the ploidy of the different structures, diploid, haploid? What is the role of the cotyledons versus the endosperm? And where is the energy stored? Okay. Any questions for we? Yeah, go on. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. If you really want to, it's kind of interesting. Like what has to happen in the, in the monocot when it germinates, all that energy that flows from the endosperm into, I say flows, I mean, it gets transported from the endosperm into the embryo. Right. In the dicot seed, when it's developing, as that seed is growing, there is, like I said, a little endosperm, and all of the nutrition goes into the endosperm first, but then immediately gets transported into the cotyledon, but that's where it ends up being stored. So, um, so it always goes from the parent plant into the endosperm and then into the embryo, but the timing is kind of different between when that happens in these two. Yeah. Good. So. Okay, so you know, for, for seeds, right, we're very dependent on them for everything about the energy storage in seeds and our use of them. Um, this is an in-flight magazine I, that I uh, took on a, on, a, on a trip to China showing uh, the fields of, of brassica napis, which is the crop that we get from canola. And it has some nice pictures in here of people harvesting canola oil in the traditional way. Uh, so they put the seeds here in these uh, little pits and they pound them with these big wooden hammers. And out of that, if you pulverize these seeds, you know, they, they form, they store most of their energy in the form of some oils, which are then can be extracted for cooking oil. So that's when, you know, so we think about starches and proteins and seeds, but remember, oils is another way that they that energy is stored too. Just to go back to this picture, if you want, this is kind of just for fun, but you can think about all of the different ways we're using plant reproductive structures for a, a nice breakfast like this. So when you drink your coffee, you know, essentially what that is, you're taking a dipot seed, right, which is just this little embryo, you're roasting it, you're grinding it up, you're pouring hot water over it, and all the chemicals that come out of that little seed are that delicious uh, coffee that gives you that little morning boost, right? So it's just a, what we would, in a, in a lab, call a water extraction, right? You pour water over it, and any chemicals that come out are, are what we look what we for. So the toast that we have over here, you know, there we have, a, you know, it's mostly wheat, so we've taken a monocot seed, we ground it up to get the starch out of there. We hydrated it, heated it up, and that gives us our our bread here too. So again, just two examples of of uh, different seed types showing up in our daily uh, diet. Okay, so there's also fruits in this picture, and now we have to distinguish between fruits and seeds. Um, and the most important thing to remember about the fruit is that it is produced from the ovary. So it is not, it is actually part of, it is made by the tissue of the parent plant, right? So the parent plant, remember the ovary, the stigma, the style, all the things we diagrammed before, those are part of the parent plant, you know? And so as the ovary develops around the seed, that is actually maternal tissue, right? If we want to think of the, the plant that holds the embryo back as the, the mother plant, right? That's all maternal tissue that is developing and growing into a fruit. So, uh, Fruits obviously are involved in protecting the seeds, right? So uh, we tend to think of when you hear the word fruit, you think of something soft and squishy and, and delicious like this. Uh, but all of these pictures here are fruits, right? And so some fruits have actually hard structures that help to protect that seed. And in the case of the two I've shown over here, uh, they you can see how they aid in dispersal, not just from coaxing animals to eat the, the fruit um, and then spread the seeds that way, but also they can grab on the animal fur and they can be blown around by the wind. But these are all seed, these are all fruit structures that we're looking at here. A lot of you are wearing 
a fruit structure at the moment, right? So the uh, the fibers of cotton are actually the you know are, are developed from the the fruit that forms around the cotton seed, and so that's been an important source of fiber for for people as well. All right, so let's just go back to this and point out some fruits, right? So basically, a fruit is just a, a ripened ovary there on the plant. So if we take an orange and we squeeze that, we get nice orange juice out of it. Um, and there's some other fruits shown here as well, right? So the tomato is a tomato on the thing on the plate here is a fruit and got some fruit mixed up with sugar to make our jam. But again, the point is lots of reproductive structures showing up in our daily diet. All right. So I started off with talking about the moon tree, you know, that's growing up near the mission. Um, and that seed that, you know, the, these are, are, are wonderful things, right? So we've got this uh, little embryo plant, you know, Dr. Yost, uh, the bio department describes the seed as like a little, a little baby plant and it's lunch, sort of packed up very tightly together, um, but also in a very protective way. And seeds are able to travel long distances. They're able to wait a long time until conditions are perfect for germination. And again, this has been a really important part of the adaptive success of the or the evolutionary success of the flower plant. Um, so one thing that is common to all plants with as far as the seed goes is uh, this idea of dormancy, right? So basically, essentially, I'm going to say approximately no metabolic activity. or gene expression. I mean, this really challenges our, you know, when you, you, you have a, a dried seed, you know, um, go to the store and buy a, a bag of dried beans, put them out on your table and ask yourself, like, are these alive or not, right? I mean, obviously, if you add water to them, they have a schedule to start growing and they can make a whole new plant and everything like that. But at that moment, when, you, when they're sitting there on your table, they are almost, you know, completely dehydrated. There's almost no water there inside of those seeds. They're not, the enzymes are not doing anything. I mean, they do have proteins in there, right? And those proteins are still not total, not nature. It's just that, you know, you talked a little bit in your book about as the seeds dehydrate, how structure, like, you know, think about the DNA, right? And the nucleus of those cells, it's still intact, even though most of the water is gone. And the way a lot of these uh, plants can do it is they replace the water molecules that they dehydrate with sugar molecules. And that kind of stabilizes the conformation of the proteins. It keeps the chromosomes intact and things like that. And basically, it enters this waiting period called dormancy. So there's no metabolic activity, very little gene expression. And then they can persist like that for many, many, many years until they get hydrated, right? So, um, and in fact, this is a requirement. Most seeds must dehydrate and become dormant, enter end of this period of dormancy before they can germinate, right? You can't just take a, a wet seed and plant it and have it grow. This is part of their, their developmental program that they have to undergo dormancy first. I'm not gonna talk too much about it today, but there are two hormones that you'll, can, there's a, like one objective about each one of these here. Abscisic acid is the hormone that helps establish dormancy. And gibberellin, the gibberellic acid, is the hormone that's important for ending dormancy once the cell once the cell rehydrates. Um, I just pulled out one picture to show you here. Here's a tomato plant that's a mutant that can't synthesize abscisic acid. And so what you see when you cut this plant open is that these little seedlings have already germinated inside the parent plant there, which isn't really, you know, the mutation, right? This isn't helpful to the, the seeds. It's not helpful to the parent plant. It doesn't bode well for the next generation, but you can see what this is called precocious germination, right? When you have some problem with these hormones that don't allow the seeds to achieve their, their normal dormancy. Yeah. Yeah, right. Each one of these little, it's the question was if we put this tomato in the ground, would we grow more tomato plants? And the answer is yes, probably we would. And if we, were controlling the conditions and fertilizing it well and everything like that, they, they might be successful, right? But when you think about natural plants out in nature, this would not be favored because first of all, you know, they would germinate, like I said, inside the parent plant. Um, they wouldn't be able to disperse like they normally would. You know, they wouldn't really be growing in the optimal conditions that they, they might otherwise have if they'd gone through their dorm period of dormancy. Yeah. 
Right, so the question is, would all the tomatoes from this plant be like that? And I think that's more of a genetics question than a plant physiology question, but the answer is yes. This is a mutant, right? So this is the parent plant had some DNA change that was passed on to all of its offspring. And so that mutation is a, a, a genetic change that's going to be faithfully carried out through the generation. Right. So you might be able to keep these alive in lab, but it probably wouldn't be successful in a field or, or in nature. All right. Here's just a nice thing about the oldest ever seeds that actually germinated. Uh, they're from a, a date palm here, and they were uh, discovered in Israel, and they are thought to be about 2,000 years old. But nevertheless, these 2,000-year-old seeds, when they hydrated them and put them in the right conditions, they were able to germinate and start to grow. So it's kind of amazing that this period of dormancy can last for, in some cases, you know, 2,000 years. All right, so now we're going to think about germination, right? So we've got... Uh, this one statement up here, you've got this uh, at, on page 44. So for sure, water is an absolute requirement for germination. All seeds require water to germinate. However, there are some other requirements that come up in some other plants. And so I've been talking a lot here. I'll let you think about this and vote on this here too. Um, so Let's look at our first question. So water is needed for germination of all seeds. Which of the following conditions might also be required for seeds that have evolved to be distributed by animals? So I've got three choices there. Don't put your hands up yet. I don't think this is a hard question. But I just wanted you to think of it as soon as you say it. So you have a, a seed that is distributed to animals. What might be, in addition to water, what might be another environmental factor that would influence its germination? Okay, hands up in three, two, one. Go for it, if you like. Okay, well, I've seen a lot of people going with B and also some people going with uh, with A here as well for uh, for light. It's probably, you know, for now, there are definitely some seeds that do require light. We'll talk about that in a second, but uh, low pH is is the important factor here, right? It has to pass through that animal digestive system uh, and be exposed to the low pH environment of the stomach before it will actually germinate. So here's another one here. Water is needed for the germination of all seeds, of course. Which of the following conditions might be required for seeds that are very small and contain very small amounts of stored energy? Go ahead and three, two, one. What do you like for this one here? Yeah, so a lot of people going A here. And so this makes sense, right? That for a very tiny seed, you know, uh, lettuce seeds are a good example. They're really, really tiny little seeds. That, um, you know, if they are very, they're not going to store enough energy for that seed to be able to, to you know, seed's going to run out of its stored energy before it can start to photosynthesize. And so these are seeds that need at least some exposure to light in addition to water before they'll turn. And now for fire also, we didn't really talk about that, but there are some seeds that do require to be, need to be treated with high temperature. And a lot of California native plants have that uh, characteristic uh, because they grow in areas that are very prone to wildfire. And there's some advantages to these seeds. They'll sit in the soil. They won't germinate until like a fire goes through the area. But the idea is that the fire would then clear away a lot of the competing plants. And then again, if they hydrate and they've been exposed to that high temperature, then they will germinate, hopefully in an environment where they are not uh, don't have a lot of large plants to compete with because of the fire. All right. What are we doing here? Good. So you know. In teaching, you're always supposed to, you always say you're supposed to establish relevance, right, for your teaching. If you want, you want students to like buy in, you have to make it relevant to their everyday lives. So I'm going to say here that without this, this last topic that we're going to talk about here, civilization as we know it would not exist if this did not work the way it worked. So um, it's kind of interesting for us to think this way, um, but at one point in human history, you know, this is about 40,000 years ago, somebody had this revolutionary idea, absolutely revolutionary, which was to take some plants that you like and clear a little area of dirt and put the seeds of those plants in the dirt and grow them up there and have a little crop. Right? That seems totally obvious to us, but this was one of the most revolutionary ideas in human history. And you know, humans have been around for about 150,000 years. The real agriculture didn't really get started until about 40,000 years. So it was usually like there was, you know, that whole early 100,000 years of human existence was mostly hunting and gathering, right? People lived in really small groups and they spent pretty 
spent all day trying to stay alive, but also trying to find food, right? And that was because they were just dependent on whatever plants or animals they could find in their environment. And it took a lot of work. It took everybody working all the time to get enough food just to make it to the next day. But then when you had this idea of agriculture, suddenly, you know, you could grow the food that you needed in a controlled way, and a small number of people could harvest that food and provide enough calories for a larger group. And so you had some people that became farmers, and then you had other people that would free up to do other jobs, you know, so people that could start thinking about art or religion or government or science or anything like that. And, you know, because you didn't have to spend all day, every day, just looking for enough calories to survive, right? So this is a revolutionary idea. But what you see on the screen here is kind of what makes this all possible, right? Here we see, you're used to seeing pictures like this. This is a big deal. Again, this is canola. So I showed you, you know, uh, seeds of canola before. It's a really common crop up in uh, northern United States and Canada. But we look across this huge field, and what we see is that every single plant in this field, they all started flowering at the same time. And remember, it's the reproductive structures that we really want for nutrition, right? So they all started flowering at the same time. Which means that, you know, if the if the, if the, the, the synchronicity of flowering, if this wasn't happening, it would be very hard for a farmer to harvest this whole field all at once. This is part of what allows agriculture to work, is this the timing of flowering or reproduction in plants is very tightly controlled. So it's important for us and it's important for civilization to exist. Uh, it's also important for plants out in the wild too, right? A lot of plants need to cross pollinate with other plants. So it makes sense for them to coordinate their flowering. So they all make flowers, they all make pollen at the same time so that cross pollination can occur and you can get genetic diversity. All right. So the timing of flowering, you know, how a plant decides when to start making flowers is really, really important, both for agriculture and also for the success of plants in the environment. And we're going to think about a little bit about what controls that. So we got to go back and review a few things here. So here's some nice pictures of meristems. You've got this on the bottom of page 44. Um, and we have two images here of the shoot apical meristem. Here it is right here. And here it is right here. Now we're looking at the same plant here, but it's the two different stages of its life. So in the first part of, of now this is you know not true for every plant but for most plants they that you can sort of divide their life into two uh, distinct phases and the first one is the vegetative phase where the plant makes leaves and it's building up its photosynthetic capacity so you can kind of see there's the, the meristem where we have undifferentiated cells and a little bunch comes off the side and they turn into here they're turning into a leaf. You can kind of, you know, use your imagination. You can maybe start to see epidermal cells and, you know, uh, mesophyll cells and xylem and phloem forming inside there. But then later, during what's called the reproductive phase of the plant's life cycle, uh, then the the we call this the, the it basically turns into a floral meristem and it starts making flowers. And so here you can kind of see this as it develops here. You again use your imagination. You can start to see, you know, anthers and stamens and petals and things like that inside the structure. So we've got these undifferentiated cells in the meristem. And at one point in the plant's life cycle, the little cells that come off of that are going to develop into leaves. But then something happens, and then there's this switch. And then after that point, then those little buds of cells that come off the meristem are going to differentiate into flowers. And so we're going to think a little bit about the timing of that here. So um, what are some factors that might influence the, the timing of the transition? Um, so go ahead and just think about this yourself for a moment. Um, again, we've got the vegetative phase over here where the plant's making leaves. And then here we have the reproductive phase. All right. So what you what I want you to do now is just see if you can think of one or two examples of things that could influence the timing of this transition. So what might be affecting the switch from vegetative growth into reproductive growth? Go ahead and 
think about one or two ideas, share them with somebody sitting next to you if you feel like it. See what kind of a list you can come up with. All right, Let's see if anybody put anything in the. All right, go ahead and you can put it in the chat if you're on Zoom. Anybody here? What is, what is, what is one thing you think could be influencing the time? What's the answer? Just somebody, uh, what's one thing that might influence the, the timing of this transition? Yeah. Okay, photo period. So that's an important one, meaning how long or short the day is, right? So a lot of people would say light, but being more specific here, it's actually photo period. Uh, is one of the things that influences this transition here. So what's another thing that you think the potential that plants could affect that might affect the, the timing of this transition? Yeah. Right, so temperature is another one. Yeah, now, not all these apply to all plants, but for plants that grow in places where there are distinct seasons, then temperature uh, is an important uh, is an important factor. Now, the thing to notice about both of these here, sorry, just a second, let me. Thing to notice about both of the two that are up here is these are both things that change predictably over the course of the year, right? The daylight changes, the temperature changes in some parts of the world, at least, right? This isn't going to work for plants at the equator, but it will work for plants in more in more temperate regions further north or south of the equator. So these are ways that the plants can coordinate this growth to the season. So, yeah, is that another thing? Oh, yeah, I was thinking water. Yeah, so um, to some extent, but uh, water and also I'll add nutrients here are also things that are going to. Influence this. And like what often tends to happen is that a plant is just stressed out for any reason. It could be because of drought, it could be because of low nutrients. Usually that trans prompts the transition to flower because it's kind of like the plant seems to respond to stress by saying, well, I better like try and make try and make flowers, try and make seeds uh, to, to to pass my genes on because like my conditions that I'm in right now are pretty good. Yeah. Oh, good question. The question here is why does deadheading a plant encourage more flowering? Um, so uh, deadheading, it would be the process of like, you know, chopping off the, the top of the plant. Um, you know, that's actually a good kind of a review thing here too. Uh, if you think about our standard sort of plant architecture with nodes and axillary meristems and things like that, you know, at some point, what we're talking about here is that, you know, this apical meristem at the top is going to switch and start, you know, producing instead of leaves and nodes, it's going to start producing flowers. Right. But it's still producing the oxen and things like that, that is going to, to inhibit the growth of those axillary buds further down. So if you were to chop this, the top off, off here, um, you know, to, to, deadhead this plant as it were, that's going to allow a lot of these uh, axillary nerve stems to start growing. And again, if it's been exposed to the right condition, so it'll be right up to whatever, but those are going to start flowering as well. So that's a good question. Nice, nice opportunity to review some stuff from earlier. Okay. There's also, the last thing I'll add here is also internal cues. By which I mean, like, how big is the plant? Is it photosynthetically? Is the, has the plant created enough leaf mass uh, or enough leaf surface area that it's able to do enough photosynthesis to support the, the development of seeds at this point? And so that is all coordinated by hormones between the leaves and the, the apical meristem and everything, too. All right. So there's all, all of these factors which could influence the timing, but this is the one that we're going to focus on and uh, that I'm going to ask you to focus on through the objective is photo period. All right. Um, and now we're going to uh, take a little trip to my house. Uh, this is over up near Foothill and Tassajara, not too far from campus. And um, when we first moved in, we had to do some work in the front of the house. And there's this little sort of uh, 
awning that hangs by the front door. And we had to take out the support for that. So just temporarily, we put in this, this post, this two by four here, uh, to hold up this little awning above the front door. Okay, so let me get you oriented here. So we have our porch light, and we, just for security reasons, we kept the porch light on all the time. So the porch light was on all night. And then over here is the post. And then on the ground here are some little landscaping plants that we had. And one day I walked out of my house and I looked down at these landscaping plants and I noticed something very interesting that's shown in this picture here, which is that even though they were all the same species, now, now in this picture we're kind of looking from the, from the perspective of the porch light, right? So we're looking from the porch down across the post and it would cast a shadow onto these plants that were here on the ground. And what you could see, even though these are all the same species, the ones that are in the shadow are vegetative, right? So these are not flowering, so these are vegetative. Whereas the ones that are outside the shadow, they are flowering. Even though they're the same species. All right, so somehow this is the case where the light, right? The, the different light regimes that they were exposed to have affected their flowering. So I've got some questions for you here. Go ahead and think through this and pick the best answer. Take a moment, talk to people around you if you want to. But what can we say about these plants here that is consistent with all of the observations? Now remember, essentially these, these plants that were outside of the shadow, they were exposed to light 24 hours a day. Sunlight during the day, and then the light from the, the porch at night, right? The ones in the shadow were experiencing something different. So go ahead and think about this. Talk about it. What, what's the best answer to this question? Read through your posters and then think about it. I mean, encourage you try and say it out loud. Try and explain your logic to somebody can thank you, whatever your answer is to this one. <laughs> All right, voting in three. Two, one. What do you like for this one here? Okay. Good. All right. Looks like people are today are going with A here, which is correct. So this plant flowers in response to long days and short nights, right? So remember these plants over here, they were essentially experiencing a 24 hour long day, right? From their perspective, they had light all the time and they flowered, right? So they need a long day to flower. Basically, if you look carefully at the choices here, uh, B and C are essentially saying the same thing. They're just saying it in slightly different ways, but neither of them are consistent with the uh, with the image here. So our little plant that we have, I don't, I'm sorry, I can't tell you the, I don't know uh, the, the name of this particular landscaping plant, but this is what we would call a long day plant. All right. So now we're gonna get the still writing here. So we're gonna think now about photo period. And these are very similar to the figures back in chapter 37, but I do them a little differently here. Um, light regulation of flower. And by the way, I will say, um, when we think about this, the, the, the effect of light and photo period on 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 flowering, the timing of flowering, it's quite different than the uh, the light and its, uh, its ability to produce phototropism, which we said earlier, and we should be reviewing for the the final, right? So with phototropism, it was blue light that was the wavelength that was essentially responsible for that uh, difference in, in elongation in the in the developing stem, and the receptor was a, a person called phototropin one. So with light regulation of flowering, it's a different wavelength. First of all, these are red wavelengths that uh, and they also have a different receptor. Um,
Oh yeah, the receptor is called phytochrome. Sorry, I just had a. Uh, but just like with any signal transduction pathway, there's still a protein receptor that somehow changes its activity when it gets you know exposed to the right either chemical or in this case environmental factor, the uh, red wavelength of light. So you'll read a little bit about phytochrome and and see read a little bit about this signal transduction pathway, but we're just going to kind of step back and look at the big picture. All right, so here we have three different uh, uh, light regimes. And so the, the white rectangles represent time that the plant spends in the light and the black are times in the dark. And so all the rectangles represent a 24 hour period. And so with this particular plant and what we're looking at here is an example of a long day plant, just like the ones I showed you in the, in the pictures a second ago. Uh, so if the you know the the in this case we have about a 16 hour light period and an eight hour dark period and the, this plant is flowering whereas if we have a shorter uh a shorter day length and a longer dark period then this plant here is still vegetative so what i'm trying to show in my picture here is that this plant has not it just keeps making leaves right as long as it's in that photo period it's going to make more nodes keep building onto its body that way and it's never going to flower all right. Now, one of the important observations people have known for a long time about how this is regulated, and uh, through this very sort of interesting experience, if you look at this bottom rectangle here, it's basically the same light and dark period, with one exception. Right? This is a short light exposure. And when I say short here, what I'm saying is minutes it's not like if you, you know like a, a, a flash of light or anything like that it's not enough to do this but if this plant is exposed to lights for you know uh, some period of minutes it will perceive that as if an entire day has happened right so we can see that the plant here even though overall we would say that this is a short day and a very long night this plant is still flowering And so essentially that, that those few minutes of light that sort of break up the darkness, from the plant's perspective, that has been a whole day, like a whole, you know, like uh, it's a whole day in the, in, the, in the plant, even though it was only a few minutes. So what this tells us, if you really think about it, is that what the plant is actually detecting is the length of the night. We call it a long day plant, but it actually might be helpful for you as you're studying this and learning about this to think of it as what it really is, is a short night plant. What it needs to flower is short nighttime periods, right? So uh, flowers in response. So it flowers in response to short night. And by taking this long night, and dividing it up with a little period of light in the middle, the plant perceives that as two short nights with a, a full daytime in between. So long day plants, totally fine. It may be helpful for you to substitute short night plants as, you, as you're thinking about this, okay? So we're going to contrast this with some other types of plants in a second, but can I clarify anything? Right there, any questions? Yeah. Oh, right. So the question is, what is an example of something that would make this short light exposure happen? That's a really good question. In nature, nothing. This is artificial, right? So this is something people realized in doing early plant physiology experiments is that, you know, you could trick the plant, right? By giving them a little bit of light in the middle of the night, they would perceive that as a whole day having passed, right? So you're right. This is not biologically relevant out in nature, but it's useful in physiological experiments. Okay. Now we want to contrast that here with the other type. These are called short day plants. And just to tie this in with the last thing, these have the opposite profile in that they flower in response to long nights. So a short day, what we call a short day plant, you can call it a long night plant, and that actually might be more helpful for you as you're thinking about this, as you're doing homework problems, as you're studying it. So this flowers in response to long nights. So here uh, we have a different, I, I drew a different plant over here, a different species. Um, 
And so this one here is vegetative when it's grown under these first conditions where the day is really long and the night is short. Now it is flowering here when we make the daytime shorter and the nighttime longer. So this is flowering. And again here, if we interrupt that night period with a, with a short period of light, that is going to fool this plant back into thinking that the, the nights are in fact very short, right? We've got two short nights with a full day in between them. And so this plant is also staying vegetative. All right, so there are some plants, we call them day neutral plants, where none of this matters. They respond to other kinds of cues and they flower, you know, they, the photo period doesn't matter to them at all. But I want to hear about the comparison of the long day plants and the short day plants. Yeah. That's, that's a great question. The question is, is the that little short exposure to light something that needs to be repeated? And the answer is no, it is a one-time deal, right? So all it needs, because what's gonna happen here, and you'll read about this, uh, you know, I talked about the, the signaling up here, right? The, when the correct photo period is perceived, it initiates a signal transduction pathway. So all you need is that one copy. To, to initiate it. And that's going to lead to a whole bunch of changes in gene expression and metabolic activity. And basically, you find these proteins, those cells are coming out of the nerve cell and turning into cells. So it is a, it's not something you have to do for days and days and days. It's a one time exposure. Yeah. Good question. Any other questions? Okay. Got to get through this part pretty fast. We'll. Yeah, we'll skip this. Okay, so here's a neat experiment um, that gave some insights into this. So this is, first of all, this is uh, the flat, a plant called Morning Glory, and this is a short day plant. And it's grown, uh, grown in 24 hour light. So basically that is, this, this plant is a short day plant, so it's a short day, but we're growing it in 24 hour light, so it definitely should not be flowering. And the one that we see here growing is vegetative, right? So it's just making a lot of leaves and it hasn't even thought about flowering yet. But it's a little neighbor that's sitting next to it. It's the same species of plant, but obviously it is flowering. And here's the, the, the trick here. There's one leaf uh, right here that is covered with tin foil. So this is a leaf covered with foil. So think about this, the whole plant, including the two gas of this plant, is exposed to 24 hour light. But we have this one leaf, because we covered it with tin foil, and tin foil is totally opaque. This one leaf is exposed to darkness. And this plant is flowered. So it tells us that you don't even have to expose the entire plant to the right photo period. All it takes is just to expose one leaf to the correct photo period, and that's going to induce this change. And again, I'm going kind of fast here because I want to wrap up in time. This is, this is I was going to ask you to think about this, but this is evidence that there must be a hormone involved. Because flowering is a change that takes place up at the shoot apical meristem. That's where the, the reprogramming and the change in gene expression take place but it is detected in the leaves. So there must be some sort of, of a communication between these two. And this has been like one of the most recently discovered plant hormones, right? So evidence for a hormone, uh, I'll just say leaf, detects the photo period. And then the shoot apical meristem responds. So there must be some sort of, you know, some sort of a signal that goes from those leaves up to the shoot. And so this, you know, from physiological experiments like the ones I've shown here, uh, the existence of this hormone has been known for a long, long time, but it's only like in the last decade or so that people have actually discovered the, what hormone this is that is important for this, this communication uh, that triggers flowering. And uh, it's actually a protein. So this is a, a protein hormone. It's encoded by the gene FT that stands for flowering time. And the, uh, 
we don't need to go through the data here or anything. You have this on uh, page 48. So this is just the title from the, the um, paper. But the hormone is called fluorogen, right? And so it is this peptide hormone that travels, um, you know, so synthesized in leaves. I should say here. So the gene is called FT or per flower enzyme, but it encodes this protein that we call fluorogen. It is synthesized in leaves in the correct photo period. So that is in a long day plant, it's under long day conditions. In a short day plant, it's under short day conditions. It travels from the leaf via the phloem up to uh, the apical meristem. So it travels in the phloem. And it triggers flowering in those meristem cells. So all these things together sort of, you know, have, have led way to the idea that, oh, yeah, this, this protein that is the sort of mythical, uh, you know, plant biology, people were looking for fluorogen for decades and decades and decades. And then just recently, thanks to the help of a lot of molecular tools and studying mutants and genome sequencing and stuff like that, it was identified that it was this gene FT that encoded, that encoded a protein that have all the characteristics that you would look for in a uh, in the fluorogen molecule, right? It's produced in the leaves under the right photo period conditions, travels up the phloem to the meristem, and when the meristem is exposed to it, it starts flowering. All right, last question here before I wrap you up. So let's just think about a mutant, right? So here we have a wild type plant. You look at this under long day conditions, it's flowering. Under short day conditions, it's vegetative. So let's think about a mutant of the same plant that would uh, be exposed to the same photo periods above, but cannot make this, uh, you know, the mutation that prevents it from synthesizing fluorogen. Go ahead, of the choices below, how would you fill in those last two boxes? Go ahead and think about that for yourself for a second. Don't put your hands up yet. We'll vote on it in just a minute. Yeah, you know, we like doing this to you, right? We say, okay, here's these hormones, here's that work. What would happen if you had a mutant, right? They couldn't make that long, or you're lacking the receptor, or something else, you know, that's important for the pathway. Okay. Three, two, one. What do you like here? Let's see what your symbols are. All right, good. Almost everybody going with A. That's correct, right? It would be, regardless of the photo period, it would be growing vegetatively. Okay. You know, even, even, you know, the leaves are exposed to the photo period. They can't make the signals and send up to the acute apical meristem. Okay. Uh, so, hey, as you're wrapping up here, um, I have up for hours for the next hour or so. If you want to head over to my office, uh, that's great. I can hang out here and answer a few questions too. 